Most of our thoughts and feelings come from our past experiences. They come from our memories. In fact, your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of all the things you've learned and experienced to date. It's an artifact. And when you have an experience, when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your five senses plug you into the external environment. And as your brain is processing all of this vital sensory data, all of that information rushes back to the brain. And when it reaches the brain, it causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks, to string into patterns, to reflect their interaction with their external environment. The moment those neurons organize into patterns, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And so experiences tend to create more long-term memories because it patterns or stamps or embosses networks of neurons into very specific patterns. And then the emotional quotient helps us to remember the event. So we learn something new intellectually. We also cause networks of neurons to form. I mean, the Nobel Prize laureate Kandel in the year 2000 found that when people learn just one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. So if they didn't review that information or repeat it, the connections pruned apart. So we know then that learning semantic information begins to organize circuitry in the brain and experiences enrich the brain. The end product of experience, of course, is the emotion and it causes us to feel certain ways. You can, you can remember where you were on 9-11. You can mm -hmm. tell me who you were with, what time of day it was, what you were doing, because whatever you were seeing in that moment or hearing in that moment changed how you were feeling. And the moment you felt altered or you felt differently, significantly, your brain perked up and you paid attention to whatever caused that. And that event in and of itself is called a memory. So then most of our thoughts and feelings tend to be within the neural circuitry of the past and the emotions of the past chemically. So if you take a thought, thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates a state of being. So if you combine a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling, and you have a series of good thoughts that are connected to a series of good feelings, that cycle of thinking and feeling creates what's called an attitude. If you have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to some pretty bad feelings, you'll say I have a pretty bad attitude today. So if how you think and how you feel creates a state of being, then attitudes are just shortened states of being. You can feel good in the morning, you can feel bad in the afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you begin to string attitudes together, when you combine an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, you start to form what's called beliefs. Now, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again until you hardwire it in your brain. And because beliefs are based on past experiences, then the very boundaries of our beliefs are how we feel. And so when our beliefs get challenged, it typically doesn't feel right. I know from the research that we've done that the redundancy of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking over time, for example, a person has an insecure thought, then they feel insecure. The moment they feel insecure, they think more insecure thoughts. They fire and wire more circuits in their brain to feel more chemicals of insecurity. And then once they're feeling insecure, they think more insecure thoughts and they do this for over and over again. The redundancy and the repetition of that cycle over time conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind. Once the body becomes the mind, that's called a habit. It turns out that 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old are a set of habituations, unconscious thoughts, unconscious behaviors, unconscious emotional reactions that function like a subconscious computer program. So back to beliefs. An attitude and attitude and attitude are shortened states of being and you combine them together then, then a belief then, the cycle of thinking and feeling over time, creates a subconscious state of being. So all beliefs are subconscious states of being. We have beliefs about God, about spirituality, about health, about relationships, about love, and all of those are based on our past experiences, but the majority of those 
beliefs, we don't even know that we believe them because we think they're true, because they're not functioning primarily in the conscious mind. If you take a belief, a belief, a belief, and you stack them together, you start to form what's called perceptions. And perceptions have everything to do with the relationships we have, the things we create, the behaviors we demonstrate, the choices we make in our relationships. Why is that important? Because then if beliefs are subconscious states of being, and you're stringing beliefs together, then most people are viewing their life through the lens of the past, unconsciously. And they are filling in reality. They're seeing reality. They're filling it in from their past memory. We know this to be true because they did an amazing experiment where they took a group of people and they had them wear these lenses. And the lenses were divided in half. And when they looked to one side, they saw one color. And they looked to another side, they saw another color. And they said to them, okay, well, wear these glasses every day for two weeks. Take your kids to school, do all the things you do at work, you know, go shopping, work out you know, live your life. At the end of two weeks, they brought those people back into the lab and they said, look to the left, what color do you see? So we don't see a color. Look to the right, what color do you see? We don't see a color. Now, it says a couple things. Number one, the eyes don't see. The brain sees. But more emphatically important is that those people were filling in their external reality based on their memory in their brain. If they were truly seeing, they would be seeing those colors, right? So then, in our perceptions then, we are overlaying our future, we're overlaying the present moment with our memory of the past. And so then, that then begins to diminish possibility. And it begins to, sh to close down the way that we can begin to navigate and function in our lives. In order for us to change any belief or perception, about ourselves and our lives, we have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in the brain and the emotional conditioning in the body, and the body has to respond to a new mind. In other words, the choice becomes an experience that the person never forgets because the internal experience begins to reorganize the circuitry in their brain and send a new emotional signature in their body. And in that moment, the person is becoming liberated from the past. How can the preacher in the deep south of the United States move into a state of religious uh, faith and drink strychnine and have no biological effects? Or the mother whose child is trapped under the car, who lifts up the car and pulls the child out. The mother doesn't say, geez, I didn't work out in two weeks, or God, I ate carbohydrates yesterday. She's not in any uh, uh, polarized state. She moves into a state of absolute certainty. And it's energy that lifts that car up, because energy is the epiphenomenon of matter. And when she makes that change internally, her body is literally responding to a new mind. So then in order for us to change our beliefs about spirituality, about money, about God, about relationships, we have to come out of our resting state and the experience inwardly has to be transcendent or greater than any past experience. And that's when biology begins to change. Now, going from that old self to the new self is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal, the genetic death of the old self. And most people, they step out into that unknown and it feels so uncomfortable, they can't predict it, they return back to the known. People say to me, well, I can't, I can't predict my future. And I always say to them, well, the best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And that void, that unknown, is the perfect place to create from. Now, why is this dangerous? Because when you're living in survival 70% of the time, there's better chances in survival from running from the unknown than embracing the unknown, right? If there's a predator out there, you hear something around the corner and you can't see it, mm -hmm. that's an unknown, you're gonna run. You're not gonna go, and it's not a time to trust. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to communicate. Here, kitty, kitty, it's not a time to do that. It's time to run. You'll never trust the unknown in that state. So if people are living by these emotional states of survival, they're never going to want to step out into the unknown because they can't predict the future, so they'd rather hold on to what they have. Turns out that those emotions of stress 
are highly addictive. They give us a rush of adrenaline, rush of energy. And so people use the problems and conditions in their lives to reaffirm their addiction to that emotion so they can remember who they are as a somebody. So then, if your thoughts can turn on the stress response, and those stress chemicals are addictive, then we become addicted to our own thoughts. So then stepping out into that unknown is where, the, where true greatness happens. Because that's where the person begins to say, what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? What behaviors will I want to demonstrate in my new life? Can I rehearse them in my mind? And the mere process of mental rehearsal, this is neuroscience now, begins to install the circuits in your brain to look like the experience has already occurred. You're priming your brain into the map of the future instead of the record of the past. And then the true, true person who's in the process of transformation will say, can I teach my body emotionally what that future is going to be like? Can I begin to embrace the joy of my new life? And their body as their unconscious mind begins to believe it's in the future instead of in the past. Now, that process is not an overnight process. We don't jump from the old self to the new self. It requires that continuous process of changing our biology. But I can tell you in observing people who have healed themselves of very serious health conditions, who've healed themselves of some pretty difficult scars and from the past, who've overcome addictions, who've created new opportunities and new uh, jobs and new uh, relationships and a new life, had to cross that river. And that is when they're literally, by a lot, from a biological standpoint, a new personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. And your personality is made up how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's sitting here today has created the present personal reality called their life. Which means then, if you want to create a new personal reality, you've got to change your personality. And that means you've got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. Look at your unconscious habits and behaviors, what you say, what you do, and become conscious of it. And change them. And look at the emotions that have kept you anchored to the past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. And I think the biggest problem is that most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. So then as we begin to demystify this, and the person starts to say, oh my God, the disease that I have is because it's connected to this personality. Is it possible that if I change my personality, just like a person with a multiple personality disorder, mm -hmm. who has an allergy to nylon stockings in one personality and, and type 1 diabetes in another, is it possible that if I change my personality, that the disease exists in the old personality and I'm literally someone else, is it possible then from a biological standpoint that they're healed and changed? So to answer the question, it's difficult because we're breaking out of a biological mold. It's difficult because most people don't know that they have within their reach all the tools to do it because they have, number three, been conditioned on some level to believe that the new hairstyle or the new uh, type of beer they're going to drink or the sports car or whatever it is, is going to change their state. Right. And that's, that's the hypnosis. And when I wrote the placebo, uh, You Are the Placebo, uh, the biggest thing that I walked away with after writing that book was how, how hypnotized and programmed we really are. And, that's bothered me ever since I wrote the book because people watch things in their external environment and they, they, they accept, believe, and surrender to those, those, that information without any analysis and they're programmed. And so when you and I start waking up and say no to those programs and we start to think that we're maybe more, a little bit more unlimited than we're given credit for and it's not driven for profits or self-interest but when people start to wake up and say, hey, you know, I healed myself of this condition. I healed myself of Parkinson's. I healed myself of lupus. I've healed myself of cancer. I've healed myself of rheumatoid arthritis. I've healed myself of chronic pain. I healed myself of food allergies. Hey, yeah, I was abused as a child. Yeah, that's right. I was, I was beat, beat up by a violent father, and I lived in vulnerability and fear for the last 25 years. But that fear has signaled the wrong gene, and I developed this genetic condition. The doctors said I had no way of healing. But when I overcame that fear and I broke out of it, 
I started to signal new genes in new ways, and that disease doesn't exist. Let me tell you, if you listen to that woman's story, and you listen to all the trials that she had gone through, and how she overcame herself, and she reached a place of such wholeness and self-satisfaction that she could care less if she had the disease, and that's the moment it went away, and you listen to that story, it's going to give you permission on some level that it's possible for you to do the same. You see someone dance the salsa well, you'll dance the salsa better. You see someone hit a golf ball like Rory, you'll hit a golf ball better. You see someone lead with love and compassion in their life, you will lead with love and compassion in your life. You see someone stand on a stage in front of 500 people and talk about they, how they overcame their cancer after their husband committed suicide, and the three years that it took her to do it, you will be inspired that it's possible for you. So then it has to start with a new consciousness and that, that it's going to come from common people doing the uncommon. And I believe that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk, you don't have to be a nun with 40 years of devotion, you don't have to be a religious scholar, you don't have to be a researcher, you don't have to have a PhD to do this. That common people around the world can do the uncommon. And if they're given the right understanding and the environment is set up where they can begin the application of that. And I have looked at over a thousand brain scans of people in meditation. And I can tell you that you and I are at our absolute best when we get beyond our analytical mind, hmm. when we get beyond ourselves. That's the moment that the brain gets so organized and so coherent front of the brain is talking to the back of the brain, the right side of the brain is talking to the left side of the brain. There's this synchronization, this psychic union going on. Kind of flow. And the person has tears of joy rolling down their face. That gestalt moment, that, that transcendent event for the person is completely subjective. But my interest is measuring that subjective experience. True. And we're capturing amplitudes of energy in people's brains that are 26,000 to 40,000 times normal during that experience. Now, they can't make their brain do that. It's happening to them. And the inner event that's happening to them is more real than any past event. And that's the moment I know their belief is changing.